Hi, everyone. Hello from the Authors Guild, and welcome to this discussion on the publishing experiences of Vietnamese American writers. Thank you to our panelists for sharing their time with us tonight. And thanks to our audience for, for showing up. Uh, this is part of our ongoing series, Business Boot Camps for Writers, which is funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and by Penguin Random House. So thank you to them and, and all our supporters. We've also partnered on the series with a number of our fellow writers organizations, and tonight's panel was co-produced by the Diasporic Vietnamese Artists Network. So thank you to our friends there for their help with this. Just a quick word about the work that we do. The Authors Guild is the oldest and largest association for writers in the U.S. Our members can get contract reviews and other legal help. We build websites and put on in-person and online programs. Um, the Authors Guild Foundation is a charitable sister organization with a mission to serve all writers in the U.S. So we welcome you to check out the, uh, the Authors Guild, authorsguild.org, where you can learn about membership and whether or not you want to join. Uh, please sign up for a free newsletter, which will keep you abreast of uh, free open events such as this. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Our moderator is Quinn Doe, a senior editor at Zando, where she publishes serious and narrative nonfiction, as well as investigative journalism, memoir, and essays. Before Zando, she worked at other indie houses, including W.W. Norton and Basic Books. Her recent acquisitions include Ken Duckworth's You Are Not Alone and uh, Ray Wynn Grant's memoir, Wildlife, for Get Lifted Books and Imprint from John Legend. She's also served as lead nonfiction editor for award-winning literary magazine, American Cordata. She's the daughter of Vietnamese refugees. She was raised in the American Midwest, educated at Yale, and now lives here in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Quinn, thank you. Thanks all our panelists. And I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny, for that kind introduction. Uh, and now it's my turn to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, I'll start with V. V. Key now is the author of seven poetry collections uh, and of the short stories, uh, A Brief Alphabet of Torture, winner of the 2016 FD2's Ronald Sukunik uh, Innovative Fiction Prize and the novel Swimming with Dead Stars. Her poetry collection, The Old Philosopher, won the Night Boat Books Prize for Poetry in 2014. Her book, Suicide, an Autoimmune Disorder of the Psyche, came out from 1111 this past spring. A recipient of the 2022 Jim Duggan's PhD Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Prize, her work includes poetry, fiction, film, and cross-genre collaboration. She was the Fall 2019 Fellow at the Black Mountain Institute. And now on to Abigail. Abigail Nguyen Rosewood is a Vietnamese and American author. Her debut novel, If I Had Two Lives, is out from Europa Editions. Her second novel, Constellations of Eve, is the inaugural title available now from DVAN uh, slash TTUP, a publishing imprint founded by Isabel Thuy Pallode, a scholar of Asian American history and literature, and Pulitzer winner Viet Thanh Wing to promote Vietnamese American literature. Her works can be found at Time Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, Salon, Cosmopolitan, Lit Hub, Electric Lit, and many more. Um, she is the founder of Neon Door, an immersive art exhibit. And after having spent over 20 years in the US, she is now a reverse immigrant living in Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam with her husband and their daughter. And last but not least, uh, Trung Tran is a Vietnamese American writer born in Saigon, Vietnam. He is the author of six previous collections of poetry, The Book of Perceptions, Placing the Accents, Dust and Conscience, Within the Margins, Four Letter Words, and 100 Words, co-authored co with Damon Potter, and most recently, Book of the Other. His works have been translated into French, Dutch, and Spanish. He is the recipient of the Poetry Center Prize, the Fund for Poetry Grant, the California Arts Council, uh, grant and numerous San Francisco Arts Commission grants. He lives and works in the San Francisco Bay Area where he teaches, makes art, and continues to write. Of his latest efforts, Book of the Other in 2022 was uh, selected as CLMP's Firecracker Prize in Poetry and the Before Columbus Foundation's 2022 American Book Award. Uh, Tran states, quote, Book of the Other is an endeavor that's taken 15 years of living, enduring, and writing. It is not a book I wanted to write. It is a book I had to write, end quote. So thank you for the panelists, uh, you know, for joining us in this conversation today. And thank you to the audience watching at home uh, and for submitting some questions ahead of time. 
I've um, gone through the pre-submitted questions and folded them into some of my own. So let's start with those discussions and then we can uh, open it up to the live Q&A. Okay, so all three of our panelists work in a variety of genres and formats, including novels, short stories, uh, essays, poetry, and art. Um, so I'd love to hear, I guess, one, how each of you decided to work in those mediums. Two, uh, ask if being Vietnamese played a role in choosing those genres. And three, ask if you think that there are some genres that are easier to break into than others as a person of color. This last one was an audience question. So um, V, uh, let's start with you. Um, can you post that question in the chat? I was trying to keep track of all of them. Oh, sure. <laughs> Sorry, I can just, you know, um, say how, what made you decide to work in the formats and mediums that you um, ultimately chose for yourself and your art? Um, well, I think um, I started out as a visual artist. Um, I was a um, um, printmaker, um, bookbinder. Um, I did a lot of calligraphy. So obviously my calligraphy background is influenced because I'm Vietnamese. <laughs> Um, I'm Asian, so it goes without saying. Um, I um, and then um, um, in the midst of um, after I graduated with a bachelor degree in art, I came to a conclusion that visual art is dead. Um, I don't know how I came up with that, but it was very close and clear to me in my early twenties. Now I'm kind of fussy of how I came to that conclusion. But um, and then I started reading all these books and shifted gear um, to writing. I started writing a, The Vanishing Point of Desire, um, my first novella when I was 25. And that switched my career from being a visual artist to a writer. Um, I do think I write um, Vietnamese, Vietnamese in English. Um, I think it's very... Uh, my poetic language and um, how I operate in the world um, is very Vietnamese. Um, do you want me to answer all three of the questions at once or do you Just, want me no, to? No, it, it was a way to open up the conversation. Okay. And I think you touched on a couple of the questions. Um, so, you know, I think there's the, the Vietnamese aspect definitely came through in terms of the calligraphy and um, the style. So uh, if, if that's... Um, if you're, you know, if, if that's okay, then we can maybe move on to um, maybe uh, Trung. Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> My apologies. Um, uh, this is a rather tricky question for me to answer because um, it's something that I I addressed really recently in, in a book that I just completed. Um, not yet published, but a, a book that I completed. And, um, of nonfiction, where in which I, I finally came out with the, the reality that um, I am a poet in some ways uh, as a default, uh, and it's a default because I I am dyslexic, and and that you know I, I've I've struggled with this with this my entire life, um, and it's only now that I'm beginning to address it. Um, and to really find the language to speak about it. But um, so I, I made very various decisions throughout my life that were all default decisions that led me towards poetry. And poetry is of, for the very fact that there are times when I read uh, and I engage with language and I it becomes a, a kaleidoscope. So that I don't always feel like I have um, access to language in the same way. So. So poetry really allowed me to look at language from a very visual perspective and, uh, and a very imagined perspective as well. So I, I, chose, I chose poetry in that way. Um, it, it is, I'm now 53 years old and I finally gave myself permission to write sentences and to, to write stories um, and, and to write incomplete sentences for that matter, right? But, but uh, that, that's something that I'm only now practicing. Um, in terms of it being related to, uh, if, if it has anything to do with being Vietnamese, to be perfectly honest, nothing in the arts for me had, had anything to do with being Vietnamese. Um, uh, because as someone who grew up in the, the 1980s and 90s, 
that's just not a path that you take. You you take you take a much more logical, more sensible path, which is to to do something that can put a roof over your head. To be honest, my, my parents were my parents weren't that elitist or anything. They just wanted to make sure that I could support myself when I got out of high school or what have you. So so the idea of being a writer was or an artist for that matter was very um, abstract to them. And also it just it just didn't equate to a sensible life. Right. Um, and to this very day it's still that. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest. My life as a writer and as and as an artist are still filled with uncertainties. Right. Um, but it's the path I chose. So it's it's one that I I, I stay stay on. I hope that it answers some of the, the questions. Yes, thank you. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, when you talk about art and, and finding the path there, I think an artist um, can take their time and try out different, you know, formats and mediums. And it's always interesting for me to hear, you know, how someone landed on the, the, um, the, the medium in which that they like to perform their art. Um, so Abigail, can you tell us, uh, you know, either your, your path to choosing uh, novels and short stories, um, as opposed to some of the other methods of, of writing and, and, and storytelling? Sure. Um, you know, I really, I really love what Trung said about how um, you've given yourself permission to start writing sentences um, or incomplete sentences. I think, like right now, um, you know, as a new mother, I, I feel like uh, my, my, um, access to language has been completely eviscerated um, after pregnancy and birth that I have to relearn um, how to um, complete and, you know, complete sentences again and how to assemble language again. Um, I have like complete language amnesia now. And I think that, um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've always been, I've always wanted to write novels. I began um, but I, I have dappled in all um, genres. I've written poetry and um, nonfiction and um, fiction as well. Um, but it's, you know, the, 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 the novel form is something that I have always obsessively uh, uh, read and, um, and it's, it's something I've always wanted to, to write. Um, and, you know, question three, like what, Genres are easier to break into than others as a person of color. I find that really interesting. And um, I do find in my own experience, I, I, I publish fiction first, but I don't know if it's an issue or not that I find that in terms of pitching essays to magazines and things like that, um, that is easier to, to, um, to pitch nonfiction as a person of color, I believe, because I think that uh, many editors might be interested in sort of like, um, you know, as so as a person of color, I feel like you're kind of always in a cash 22 to kind of participate in a panel like this is necessary and important, but also it, it you know, the cash 22 is that you're kind of focusing on your identity once again, rather than your work. And so that's always really painful, um, I think, for uh, to navigate. And, and so, you know, with, with breaking into um, writing with uh, nonfiction, um, I'm, I'm always kind of juggling this, this, um, this feeling like if I'm writing about something related to my identity, like have I kind of given in to the pressure of the industry, even though, you know, even though sometimes I do want to write about my identity and other times I don't at all. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's, it, it seems to be the only thing that mainstream publishing um, or even um, indie publishing um, mm -hmm. are interested in from, pe from people of color sometimes that it feels almost like, um, selling out myself yeah. um so that's something yeah so that's that's something I think about a lot yeah and speaking to you know I assume that there are some prospective writers in the audience um and when you mentioned pitching and writing nonfiction pieces do you mean just kind of like getting your byline out there so that 
you know, more and more readers are familiar with your work before you can, you know, try to sell like a novel or a short story? Um, so I, uh, so um, I started doing a lot more pitching um, before, uh, before I came out with my, my, my second novel was released. And um, it's not, it, it wasn't really just to get my name out there. It was because for, for some reason, I just wanted to write a lot of essays. Um, uh, and I, and it was the genre I was interested in uh, doing the most, but it, it certainly helps with getting your name out there quickly. I think in terms of publishing with, you know, um, more mainstream magazines, like, um, then I think uh, it, it does, it does help with promoting um, your book. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. Thanks. And we were talking about this moment um, in time where it seems like publishers and also readers are pushing for you know, diverse voices. Um, and that's, you know, it's a phrase that we can you know, unpack. Um, but do you feel that you as writers have to position yourselves, you know, when speaking to potential agents, publishers, even directly to readers um, about your own cultural identity? Uh, you know, just type, try to push that diversity narrative forward. Do you play up or play down your Vietnamese American identity at all? Um, um, I'll let whoever. Fun to uh, everybody. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Abigail. Uh, if I can, I can jump in on this one because ultimately, I think I am who I am. I, you know, like, and and there is that notion. I my one of my mentors uh, many years ago said to me, you know, be careful of the stage that you're building because you will you may find yourself standing on that stage one day and you will have no choice but to perform. Right. And so I'm always very, very um, conscious of that, that reality that, that there's always a stage, even if I'm trying to walk off a stage, there feels like another stage extends itself. And, and here I am on the stage again. But the key to for me and what I do is, is like, there is this understanding that to, and to my audience, my often, often that audience is white. You know, the, the idea is that you think you're looking at me, but really I'm looking at you, right? I'm, I'm, you're on that stage as far as I'm concerned, right? And that, that's how I, I sustain my own writing practices to make sure that, that, that is part of my consciousness that I'm working with. Um, you know, um, as I, as someone who's a poet and who's published with several different publishers, one thing that I have learned in this process and the thing that I've learned uh, through this last process of publishing with Kai is that it is really important for us to have a relationship with our publishers in a way that they really see us. Like, it's like curation is not inclusion folks. And I'm, I'm just gonna put that out there again. Curation is not inclusion. It's like we, and unfortunately we as writers of color um, are often curated whether it be with a publisher or with within the uh, uh, anthology or whatever, often we are curated, but, but that is not inclusion. That, that is, a, that is a, um, an illusion of inclusion, right? But what I gained from this last experience of working with Kaya is that um, there was uh, a, an editor and publisher named um, Sun Young Lee, and she was able to ask me the questions that I, I think in my previous um, engagements with editors, I've never had the opportunity to, to engage with. It. And, and the question was simply why? She kept on asking that question to me again and again and again. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing what, I, what it was I was doing with this book? And because she knew that it was something else it tucked inside. And that, that persistence on that question actually brought me to a whole other rendering of that book that I'm so grateful for. And I don't think I could have had that with any other press. And ultimately, um, it's a book that was also very controversial. And, and at one point, you know, there was there was threats of, of it being uh, under some kind of litigation. And, and honestly, if, if I was being published by, by any other press, 
and by any other press, I'm talking about a press that, that is represented by, by uh, a white presence. I don't know if they would have stood next to me in those moments. But, but Kaya being a, uh, an Asian American press representing the diaspora really stood next to me. And they weathered that storm and ultimately, you know, people backed away because of that. Hmm. I'm you know, curious if you, if, because I think the question why is very important, but do you, would there be a difference, I guess, uh, of having, you know, perhaps a white editor ask you why versus someone who might be Asian American in an editor asking you why, because maybe, you know, they might not, uh, the white person might, editor might not come from the same, you know, cultural background. Um, can you think, tell me there a is an bit absolute, about that, the perspective? Yeah, I just want yeah. to tease this out a bit. <laughs> yeah, there is an absolute difference because I've actually had, I, I have been asked that question before, but, but the question coming from a white perspective was not about, pushing me to go further into my inquiry. It was about positioning themselves in, in that inquiry. It was like, it was like mm -hmm. the question was why? why? Why would you do this to yourself? Why couldn't you just go to another institution and, and start all over again? It's like, whereas the question coming from someone within my own community was like, why? There's something that you're not saying. Mm -hmm. There's something that we, we're still hiding in this, in this equation because because of who we are, right? And and so that that question received from someone trusted is a different inquiry, right? And and that and that was that was why I was so grateful to have that opportunity. Um, Abigail or V, have you had similar experiences where you felt that you needed to justify your work and and art um, to an audience that might not have that background and 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 might not understand? you know, the, the point of view that you're coming from and or, and or be asked to either water it down or um, explain yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the, the question of diversity or explaining myself is always, it's quite loaded and, <laughs> um, and difficult to answer, but um, I, you know, I think, I think it's always um, a little bit tricky um, with with publishing because um, I think, as I said before, it's like I I am interested in exploring you know different aspects of Vietnam, being of being Vietnamese. And that's always going to inform my work. Um, but I think I think it's coming from like you know my, uh, being a writer of color. There's always um, suspicion like like I'm coming from almost like a like of of um, maybe you know the uh, the publisher's intention of how to market you or how to curate you or how to you know so I think it's it's also really important to like establish and build trust um uh because otherwise it's um it, it's 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 very it's very difficult to know if where the where where the person whether the publisher may be coming from um, when they are positioning you in a certain way. Um, if they're doing it, you know, um, from like a commercial angle, if it's just a pure, purely entrepreneur um, entrepreneurial decision, or if it's insensitive to um, my my background, like I, I can never quite pinpoint that but I but I, I feel like I'm constantly um wondering about it as well and um and I, I am sensitive to it mm -hmm. um, and, and what are you know what are the questions that you might ask a prospective agent um or an editor that you might want to work with to see if you can even establish that trust um just thinking about the perspective of some of the authors and writers who might be listening and, and seek, you know, kind of guidance and advice? Sure, I think, um, I think that requires like many conversations, but I think, be, I think um, agents and editors who are aware it, um, of that sensitivity, um, it's, it always become apparent very early on. Um, and if they, if they're not, it, it's, it's also kind of, evident too 
um, you know, I, I talk a lot about, I have spoken about, you know, the, the, um, the cover of my first novel um, that, I, that I try to fight, I push against. And, um, you know, because I, I, I know that my, my first publisher had, um, uh, you know, has many, many covers that feature the same, you know, feature like real people's faces, um, real women's faces. So um, it wasn't unique to my situation, but because of my, my background and I felt like putting, you know, kind of some random Asian woman on the cover was kind of an outdated choice. Um, and, and so I didn't agree with it. And I, um, and I, 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 and I tried to, to speak against it and I didn't, um, I didn't succeed. Um, but, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it's a complicated relationship because it's also, the, my publisher was also the one that like gave me the, the chance and believed in me, you know, whereas like no one else did. So there's kind of a, like both gratitude and mixed with like, oh, I have to work with this, you know? Um, and, and so that it's always kind of hard to, to, um, to juggle all those things. Um, and I think, I, I think maybe gratitude sometimes is a danger being a, in, in being a, a person of color too, because maybe I'm, I'm always constantly overwhelmed with gratitude that I don't, fight enough for things that um, that I should, you know, uh, or like speak up more um, because I feel like I should be grateful with the little bit that I gain, like every step that I gain, oh, I should be grateful for that and just accept that. And hopefully you have, you know, an agent and editor who after you establish establish that trust, they can help be your allies and help advocate for your vision for the book. Because at the end of the day, it's your name on the cover, right? It's your art and it's art, your work. Um, v, could you, uh, did you want to add to this or speak to um, kind of this issue of whether it's positioning yourself uh, to, you know, a white audience or a white publisher, or maybe deciding not to do that and, um, you know, working with folks who might have a similar background to you? Um. Well, um, there were a few other um, <laughs> ideas that I also want to, hopefully I'll be able to concisely add it into this conversation. But I do wish I knew how to sell myself out. I just don't know how to. I, I tried to um, with my novel, Fish in Exile. I, at least I attempted, but very unsuccessfully because um, due to how experimental my writing is, so even if I knew how, even if there is a system that is able to exploit one um, ethnic um, um, uh, situation or conditions or preferences, um, um, and those opportunities are require certain um, alignment between uh, you and 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 faith. And so, um, and no matter how I want to cultivate a more mainstream uh, voice um, it's really hard to cultivate it um, um, I've tried so many different manuscripts to write outside my voice outside of my um, and within my ethnic uh, circles I tried to do that and very unsuccessfully in part because I really don't know what demographics I'm really or um, who is my who my readers are and so um, I've worked with a lot of presses, um, very small presses and from and predominantly uh, white folks, you know, white editors, white publishers. So they, in general, they have good intentions, the um, infrastructures and economics and um, uh, intramural and commercial dimension of their existence it's uh, because they are small presses they also operate within those um esoteric confines so they don't have that um so whatever small sector of my uh, ethnic existence they couldn't even exploit it because the uh, it's overwhelmed by my experimentalism and so to truly see the full strength of that um, 
to see, to feel the blow of that, the ethnic blow of that, um, I would need to be published by a mainstream press for me to see the range um, of prejudice and also the range of um, uh, commercial impose, impositions on my work. Uh, and because those don't exist, I still um, um, live in a barely um, a constricted um, publishing um, um, condition. And um, um, also, um, I, uh, I, because uh, I'm so um, prolific in my work, um, there have been opportunity for me to work with different people. So I, I try with everyone, you know, mm -hmm. like if, if they're, um, if they have a publishing house, I am most likely to go for it in part because um, in the past, I would be one of those uh, Vietnamese people that um, saves, you know, like uh, we tend to be more um, um, a conservative about how we spend our resources. And I consider literary products as also our resources. Mm -hmm. It's and so I would save these for like some rainy days. And I realized as I um, uh, I was dying in New York in a Brooklyn apartment in New York, I was like, I don't know why I'm, you know, saving all of this. Um, and so um, when I recover from my, um, uh, my uh, uh, near death experience, um, I decided to uh, low all of this work, uh, I mean, uh, pull all these, um, drag out all these work out into the world. And, and I'm like, I don't really care who published me now, um, <laughs> as long as there is a publisher. And um, there was um, uh, my friend, uh, one of the publishers uh, who just started out as uh, self-publishing, her name is Diana Lay, and she is Vietnamese. Um, and she's really young. She's in her early 20s. And she asked me to write an introduction to a friend that was living in Las Vegas. And I didn't, if, I, if she didn't ask me to write that introduction, I probably wouldn't know her about her press. And it was, it was the first time that I worked with one, a Vietnamese editor, and two, um, um, a pressure that was run predominantly just woman. She's just herself running it. And um, I read on her blog about how um, how um, um, how she uh, uh, had an addiction for shopping, you know. And then she said, "But publishing books will cure, you know, curve my uh, shopping addiction," which I thought was a really fascinating way to like introduce myself. I'm like, hey. Um, would you like to curve it even more by, you know, publishing my work? <laughs> and um, and working with her was really awesome because I think I've, like, there is um, this unwritten language, uh, unspoken language between working with her that's so different than working with other presses that she's very intuitive. She's sort of like, um, understand what I need in that moment or advocate for it but there's a, this um this decision making that feels very tender and of commercial at the same time that she just able to marry those impulses those intuitive impulses that where a, a, a press is protecting you and also giving you your voice and at the same time realizing this is a you know like this is not a nonprofit. it's not it's a business model and it needs to exist as something that can disseminate great work and and her being so young and so in her early 20s, and I'm just putting all my reign my, onto her and trusting her process. And she's probably one of the best editors I've worked with. I mean, yeah. her level of kindness, her attentiveness, um, like the fact that, you know, like um, when uh, I read in her blogs, there were just these micro little things, details about like Vietnamese culture that is so uh, silently and quietly stitch into um, the the hemline of her her, her publishing uh, model, which I think it's really exciting because I think in uh, Western culture there's this need to pronounce ourselves, you know, announce yourself, this say clearly what you want. We want to hear your voice, but 
I think a lot of Vietnamese culture is that those glance, those silent, quiet, these reserve, which is very profound in Vietnamese culture, which I don't think is like being demure or shyness or anything. It's just, this is how we communicate in an assertive way through quiet um, assertion. And these um, these underneath language, these bridges, um, working with her really excited me. I'm like, oh, I would like to work with more um, Vietnamese or Asian um, uh, editors because I want to understand deeply how they understand my needs so well when I've been working so hard to advocate my desire to these mainstream Western presses. Um, so they have really good intentions. They they kind of like navigate in this dark water as well. And so I don't fault them on, you know, their heartfelt, you know, and I'm grateful uh, for their approaches. And um, but I also am ready for a, a world in which that invitation for a broader language in which I can be bilingual. And, uh, um, and I don't mean bilingual as in language and text, bilingual as in um, experiencing the bilinguality of um, commercialism, uh, publishing industry, in which there are more than one language in which it's spoken. It's not just like it's, uh, it's too white. You know, that was a monolithic language that I don't want to speak anymore. I want to speak a different kind of um, literal language. And Diana Lay, when she as, she as she's working through my manuscript called My Yellow Heart, which is a poetry collection and working with. And, and the thing is, she kind of she embraces the weird, you know, she kind of like see it as another segment of my Vietnamese, as opposed to, um, oh, oh, OK, um, uh, we need to change your voice because, you know, why don't you sound more Vietnamese? She sort of like embrace my experimental voice and capture it in a way that is very gentle and um and kind and and um entrepreneurial which I think is like I imagine it's almost like going to like the way that she set up because it's uh, an indie press and it's so tiny is at the birth of its um uh its beginning it's almost like going to Vietnam and going to those um a food store food store st yeah, stalls, yeah, stalls yeah um, and eating the um uh, the bun bèo, you know on the on the side of the street and just going and seeing it being wholesome and it takes so little work and it just and it's so delicious and um and that's my experience with Diana Lay and so I don't know if I went off the tantrum but I hope I was able to answer some of the questions that you were raising. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like you had a similar experience with Diana that Trung had with Kaya and um, the ways in which you didn't feel that you had to explain yourself or if the editor asked you why that was a way to push forward your, you know, your art and your narrative rather than um, having to explain yourself on the page. Um, and, you know, if Diana is open to, to submissions, I'm sure there are folks who might be interested in uh, getting in touch with her. <laughs> so uh, thank you for sharing about her work. Um, yeah, so I could also add to that as a, um, and I hope this never happens to anyone else, but um, if it came down to, and you, you're you're with the publisher and they're they're putting a spot where they have to really represent you, the hope is that they will stand by you. Right. And and I have I've I've witnessed on occasion when a press because they're a small press they don't have the resources and they 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 encounter a larger entity be it an institution an academic institution or something that they they will they will not stand they cannot stand in many ways and so the hope is that you you're you're going to partner with a press that is going to be able to stand with you especially if you know going into the process that this is a very tricky endeavor, right? It's like, as as a writer, it, it is incumbent upon you to really do your research and find the press that is going to stand next to you. Um, in my particular situation, my book went through the hands of three different presses before it got to Kaya. And in hindsight, I look at that and I think that none of those three previous presses would have been able to stand next to me had had they encountered what Kaya encountered. But because because Kaya is very particular in its its focus, it, it represented the Asian di diaspora as a publisher, they really did 
stand next to it because it's part of their endeavor. Right. Yeah. And, and, and mission too, I'm sure. So that was probably one of the reasons why you ended up choosing them. Um, and just going back to this idea of having to explain yourself, Abigail, I wanted to ask about you and, you know, you describe yourself as a reverse immigrant, you know, how has your move and kind of environment, right, in Vietnam now affected your writing and being in this majority setting now, if, if at all? <laughs> um, it, it feels really strange. Um, I think, you know, being Vietnamese American in America, um, or being here, I feel more American than I've ever felt my whole life. Um, I didn't realize how American I was until I moved back. Um, so I think it's going to inform my writing a lot. I mean, at the moment, I'm not writing at all because I have a newborn. Um, but I do think that that is going to it's it's going to change um, how I approach language um, and how I you know I'm I'm reading many um, well when I can I'm, when I can I, I'm reading you know Vietnamese works by Vietnamese writers here um, in Vietnamese so I think I think just having access to that is is going to to change uh, my writing. Um, but uh, it 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 does often it it does feel um, in some ways safe to be in the majority right now. Um, you know, moving around in space. Um, I think in the U.S., like sometimes there's a feel there's a feeling of like maybe feeling too special, like maybe even walking down the street, like just standing out when you don't want to sometimes or. You know, in, in your group of friends, you might be the only Asian person, uh, you know, uh, at a barbecue, or you're always kind of looking around and, and seeing how many other person of color is there, you know, to kind of um, pinpoint um, or finding comfort. And uh, I think right now, I, I don't even, it's, it, I have the luxury of not asking those questions, um, being in the majority. Um, and, you know, I, t I recognize that we've talked a lot about challenges, but I do want to ask, you know, what are, what are the joys? What keeps you motivated to continue, uh, you know, making your art? Um, I think that the, it's, um, you know, what, what you read in Trump's bio, like, the, like he had to, he had to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's always um, how I feel about writing is that not not that I want to do it. Um, I I love it, um, and I love I love completing things, and I love like having written a beautiful sentence. Um, I think that maybe that is the joy. It's like you know when when you know you have you have assembled these like pearls of um, of words, and you have something even just one sentence at the end of the day that you're proud of. Um, that's, I think that's why I, I keep writing or, and then I, I think also to, to precisely, um, in a new way, describe an emotion that, 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 that maybe, that maybe people are very familiar with, um, but, but it hasn't been said in this way to, to come up with like a new way to, to describe an old emotion. V, do you want to say something or? <laughs> I was just thinking of bun bail, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's there's a desire for me to to document my existence in, in a way. And by that, uh, not just the, the successes of, of a book or uh, art, but but also the many failures. It's, it, it's the attempt that's really what keeps me alive. And honestly, it's like, like, I think I would be very depressed human being if I didn't make art or write and, and, and do things that, that keep me on that mode of creating. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm always keeping, there's, there's never a moment when I don't know th that I don't have to do something with either my hands or with, my, with language or with materials, but something is always in process for me. And it, it really is a way of just keeping me alive. 
you know, it's like, yeah, it was the day that I stopped doing all that is the day that I'm, I think I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I, yeah, I, at this point, I, I do, I wonder I, if, I, you know, if, if all writers have some form, or I suspect if all writers have some form of um, depression, because, you know, I think, I think for me, like writing is a way of, of dealing, of dealing with, with, with depression. And I think that, you know, what, um, uh, it's, uh, when yeah, when I'm not writing, I, I do think very, very, um, very deeply. So um, it it's it is a, a great motivator. <laughs> Mental health is a great motivator um, as a yeah. practice, perhaps. Yeah. Um. So we are, I think, running a little low on time. So um, I did want to now. <laughs> get over to the live Q&A. Uh, I think, um, Johnny, there have probably been some questions that have come through since we've um, started. So why don't you go ahead and uh, take the lead on that? Thank you. Yeah. And, and thank you for that, that great discussion. I know it's hard to put everything in a short span of time like this, but you've offered a lot of great insights, I think. Um, so a few people asked earlier today, basically, um, is it advisable to write um, you know, an immigrant novel, an ethnic novel, um, per se. Um, and I think you've spoken to that sort of idea plenty. Um, but someone asked, are there new narrative options for, for second generation Americans um, to write about? Maybe you have examples of books, um, authors, people should look at. I think you, the writer, have to really take that lead in a sense. If you have a story, something that that is is divergent from that expectation of the immigrant identity novel. Do it, put it out there, write write it, and uh, and and see how it's received. I I I do think that um, we live in a world where we are conditioned by by these expectations. Um, we know exactly what the formula is to be received and and welcomed by by the reading public by the reading public I, I think you know let's let's be real here the the majority of the of that audience is going to be you know a white audience it's like, it's like I, I often joke and say how do you write write the book that uh uh 10 white people will ten, tell 10 of their white friends to read your book and and so on and so forth because that's that just seems like how how success is measured but Versus writing a book that begins with you motherfucker and ends with you motherfucker indicting a culture, right? It's like, how do you, how do you do that? But, but ultimately you still have to do that for yourself. Like, so I, I say, if you have something that is divergent from that expectation, don't shy away from it. Find a way to embrace it. Find a way to put that into your own words, into your perspective and claim it in the world. Um, we got a few particular questions. Um, do any of you have any experiences with uh, selling foreign language rights or, or non-North American rights to your work, whether in translation or not? Um, did you have different experiences with publishers outside of the US, if so? Um. My, uh, yeah, I, I sold, um, I guess, North American rights to the UK and Italy. Um, and my book was translated into, Ita my first novel was translated into Italian. Um, but that, that was a package deal with my first publisher. Um, they, they had, you know, they had their, their parent company was Italian, uh, is Italian. So it was, you know, it was handled through them. Um, yeah. I've had works um, translated, but it it doesn't equate to money or anything. It's just, I mean, uh, the the beauty of that moment was that someone in Mexico and someone in in the Netherlands found my book and decided they wanted to translate. It was like, who am I to say no to that? You know, it's like so they did the work, and I said, by all means, uh, um, that was really important to me to just be able to to give that. Um, opportunity to someone else um the greatest thing i got from that was that the the Mex mexican translator 
felt that he needed to tell me that he did not translate into um, 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 the Queen's Spanish. He wanted to he wanted to me to know very clearly that he, this was Mexican Spanish, and that was that was important for him because he didn't read my work as the Queen's English either. It was like you know he's, he thought it was something different there. And that's kind of like what V was saying about um, you know being open minded about the publishers that she was submitting to and uh, kind of just almost like diversifying the. Um, the opportunities and uh, you know the options for herself in terms of putting her work out there. Yeah, I I really agree with that. You know, I I feel like I've heard from you know many writers like, oh, I don't I don't want to give up this story to this this place, and you know, and I and I've always just I just didn't understand that. Um, uh, I, I pitched my second novel to a UK publisher myself. I do work with an agent. Um, and so she, she handled it once, um, you know, uh, I've been accepted by the UK publisher. Uh, it's a small indie publisher. Um, but, but to me, it's, 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 it's more about finding the person that really loves your work um, and really understand it. And I, it's it just, for me, just about throwing your work out there. And, you know, even if it's just for one other reader, um, I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't like try to, I don't try to hold on to my work and then hope for, you know, some, some, something giant to happen 50 years from now, I want to be publishing now and, and, and keep writing. Um. Someone asked about film rights. Uh, are you concerned ethnicity would be stripped from your stories uh, in a TV or film adaptation? That's it. Uh, I think that's a good question. You know, I think the Authors Guild would say retaining control wherever possible is great. Um, keeping film and TV rights to yourself so you can decide what to do with them is great. Um, but it's hard. I mean, uh, Abigail spoke about the cover design. And that's something that you know, ideally you want to retain control over, but you don't always. Um, has any, have any of you sold TV or film options? Um, I retain all my uh, films rights for everything. So, and the theatrical rights. And so, um, and with some manuscript UK rights. So I just retain as many rights as I could. Um, I don't know where they will go, but um um, as better than not having them. I'd like to have options if one day if I want to be a playwright and I want to convert one of my um, novels into a playwright, a, a screen writing piece or um, a play that I have the uh, um, license to do so. So um, I always request those rights and they always willing to they're all happy to give it to you. Um, hardly anyone bought for it except for one publisher, but he died before um, um, the book came out in the world. Um, and so I retain all the rights to, um, uh, as a result of his death. So um, it was so good. Uh, well, many people are looking for suggestions on where to go to get published and or to find an agent. Um, it's been a little chatter in the Q&A box. Uh, Amy Lay said she founded Quillhawk Publishing and love more stories from the diaspora. So everyone can look up Quillhawk Publishing. And she also recommended, um, you know, to, to use Query Tracker and attend writing conferences to meet people. Um, does anyone have any other advice along those lines? I found a website online through one of uh, one of my students actually who suggested it's called Readsy R E E D S Y dot com, and it's a website that um, connects you with agents and editors and um, and people who are even in the business of helping you craft your book proposals. If you have not, if you have a work of nonfiction and you're trying to get it published. Um, Apparently, there's this whole process of writing a book proposal that, that is quite intensive, and I, I'm, I'm having all sorts of problems with it. But um, uh, 
that's what I'm going to be doing over the break. So, um, I would Actually, say, if, oh, go ahead. When, if I could ask you a question, like as an editor, what are you looking for when you're when when things like book proposals come through your come through your sure. presence? Um, I would say, again, it goes that comes down to the relationships that you have in the industry. So uh, if there is a project that comes from an agent that I know and trust, and I know that I will like their taste, I will, you know, if they send something, I'll, I'll read it right away. And for a nonfiction book proposal, it usually has an overview of what the story or the um, argument is. There is a sample or there's like a proposed table of contents. Um, a uh, kind of marketing and comps uh, section where they talk about, the author talks about the books that um, their book hopefully will be in conversation with. And then also uh, an actual sample chapter so that I as the editor and the publisher can get a sense of how they'll execute on their um, idea or story. And so, you know, it is a combination of, do I find the framework or idea um, fresh and interesting and compelling enough for me to want to read 40 to 60 pages? Uh, and what is that voice like on the page? And then from there, if if I have a strong enough connection to the material on the page, I will try to have a phone call and make a set, you know, get a sense of how uh, that author operates and what their ambitions are and goals and positioning, um, you know, ideals are for the book, just to see if we can enter into a good relationship that will last, you know, two to three years because it takes a while to publish nonfiction. So, um, you know, it is, it's a combination of factors, but I would say for me personally, it, it really comes down to voice um, and uh, just kind of the way in which the author makes me want to stay on the page with them. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, and, and, but I went, what I wanted to say about getting agents, and I, and I tell this to prospective authors all the time, um, look up the books that you really admire and then go back to the acknowledgements and see who the agents are. Because if, if that type of book is um, along the lines of what you're trying to publish, then you can point out to the agent that, you know, they've already represented something that is similar or might be a comparable title um, and that your stories and, and style might be within the same taste that they have. Yeah, for me, I, uh, you know, when I was searching for my agent, I went to uh, like a kind of agent author speed dating thing at the new school. Um, so that's where I met my current agent. Um, her author didn't show up, so I kind of just swooped in and, and pitched my novel. Um, but I also, I sent uh, our queries very widely. And I, I'm, you know, I was very organized about the spreadsheet and um, you know, list of all the, the major agency and the smaller ones. And um, I try to submit uh, widely to both um, senior agents and junior agents, but my focus was on junior agents because I wanted somebody that I could grow with um, that had, you know, a smaller list of authors um, and, and more attention and more time um, to, to work with me. Um, so that was my approach to finding an agent. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, but in terms of finding um, publishers, I would say be, just because, um, uh, you know, once you have found an agent doesn't mean that you shouldn't still continue to advocate for yourself and um, continue to be very um, knowledgeable about the industry and, um, and, uh, and keep up with, you know, all the different um, uh, in these spaces, um, because I, my, my agent and I like, are always, um, we're always in conversation and, you know, uh, I would, if I, if I find like an, uh, an, um, indie publishing house that I'm interested in, then I'll, then I'll ask her about it and, you know, tell her about it. And, and then she would tell me like, if she's had a previous relationship with them or not. Um, but I think ultimately you're still your own, um, you're, you're still your own best advocate. So yeah. I don't I don't I don't stop pitching because I have an agent. <laughs> All right. Well, we're at the hour there. So we'll 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 put a pin in this. Um, this has been a great discussion. Many thanks coming from the audience as well. Um, Quinn, Vicky, Trung, Abigail, thank you so much for being here.
um, to the audience, please feel free to get in touch uh, with us. You can email me at support at authorsguild.org and you can find um, more at webinars in the series on things like finding an agent, the path to publication. A lot of great groundwork to start with um, if, if you're interested. Um, but with that, I'll say, I'll say good night and good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.